You had a good Thanksgiving, right? Uh, you experienced all the realities of this great blessing that we have in our lives. I hope that's your case. And for me, even in spite of the reality of all that I had to be thankful for, the family that we had around on Thursday, the reality of good food and good company and good fellowship, even in the presence of God, i got to be really honest this morning. You ready for that? I'm not okay. Does that bother anybody that your pastor gets up on Sunday morning and goes that he's not okay? I mean, Matthew West has said it well, right? I've played this song for you before. I say I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine, but I'm really not. I'm broken. Listen, I, I, I have... I, I tell you this all the time, but I, and you know it to be true. I have an amazing wife, right? But, but I don't always value her as I ought. Sometimes I live in a tension of loving myself more than I love her. <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody's experienced this or not, but marriage sometimes is hard. Things creep in. You with me this morning? And I'm not Okay. I have amazing kids. They've produced even more amazing grandchildren. But I, 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 I love my kids, but, but their adult lives sometimes bring challenges that I can't fix. When they were little and just needed five bucks for their lunches, right, I could fix that. Now they have, like, adult problems that I can't fix, I, I won't delve into all of those. We are on the World Wide Web today. But I, I will tell you this. Some of you are, are aware that my son and his family are preparing to move to Arkansas. I mean, I'm okay if they go. They just can't take my granddaughter with them. Right? I, <laughs> You, you, you understand? So, and, and it goes into all these things. They've got to sell a house. They've got to buy a house. They, they, they're, they're, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you this or not, but they're pregnant. Yes. So I was just taking one of my grandchildren. They're now taking two of my grandchildren to Arkansas. That's 14 hours away. I've looked for lots of ways to get there quicker. It's 14 hours away. And they have all of these things, all these transitions, a high-risk pregnancy, right? You get it. When your kids are not okay, what? You're not okay, and I'm not okay. I pastor, don't tell them this, but I pastor the most amazing church in all of the world. Yeah, right. But you do bring challenges from time to time. Challenges I can't fix. Listen, I want to lead you better. I want to shepherd you better. I want to see fruit in our ministry. And sometimes I have a really hard time being satisfied. I am not okay. Then, I don't know if you realize it, but we live in a broken world. That This world is not okay. I won't get into all of that. I think you watch the news, you, you know. But when the world is not okay, what? I'm not okay. I want to fix the world. I'm more anxious than I probably ever have been in my life. I am, if I'm honest, there's probably some seasons of simple depression in my life. I, 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 and I'll stop there in case you start really getting worried about your senior pastor. Um, if you're visiting this morning, I really am this messed up. Uh, and, and, and I need you all to know that I'm not okay. And I start there this morning in order to give you space to admit this morning that you're not okay either. Because often in church, we seem to spend a lot of time saying, well, it's going to be okay. And somehow that has been interpreted by many that we have to be okay. 
So we walk into church and we fake it every Sunday so everyone thinks we're okay. And if someone were to ask us if we're okay, the, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll lie to them, quite frankly, and tell them that we are okay because we think we're supposed to be okay. And, and as we lie to them and tell them they're okay, we end up less okay than when we started, which wasn't okay to begin with. So I'm sorry, Sunday mornings screw you guys up more than anything, right? But can we take space this morning to tell the truth? We're not okay. And in case, by chance, there happens to be someone here who, who thinks they're okay, instead of a long theological discussion to try to persuade you that you're not, Okay, I, I'll just steal an image from a guy. His name is Cornelius Platinga. You can't be okay if you have a name like Cornelius Platinga. He's written a book called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. And, and he points out that the last time things were okay in this world was back in the Garden of Eden. But since then, a thing called sin has vandalized that perfect place with cans of spray paint over and over and over again. Our history has been vandalized. Our culture has been vandalized. And you have been vandalized by sin. And it's made it so that we are not okay. Sometimes we talk about it as being broken. For the sake of Advent this year, we're going to talk about it in terms of being weary. Does that word resonate with you this morning? Weary. We are not, okay, but good news, we are not alone in history. So three stories this morning of a weary world. Three stories of a weary world. The first is the weary world of Israel. Israel is called into existence in Genesis 12 as Abraham is called by God to settle in a land that he does not know. Great story. You might want to go back there and read it. Israel then goes on, gets its name, Israel, through Abraham's grandson, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel after a significant wrestling match with God. And then the nation of Israel would be forced to live for centuries in a foreign land in Egypt after being forced from their land by famine. But they would return to their land and conquer it by God's grace. And out of a lack of faith in God, they begged for a king. And God gave them Saul. That didn't go well. But fortunately then, God provided David and then Solomon. And Israel was powerful. From Solomon, the nation split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. There was a whole rotation of really bad kings mixed with a few good kings. But it was ultimately a time of moving from this place of power and strength in the power and strength of God to a time of weakening. And throughout this time of weakening, the nation was in a pattern, listen, this might sound familiar, a pattern of running from God till they realized that that wasn't a good idea. Then they would run to God until their selfishness caused them to run again from God, right? And so you see this cycle, run to God because he's good, awesome, good. Okay, now I got it, so I'll go do what I want to do again, and now I'm from God. And then things all fall to pieces, so we run back to God. And if you read the Old Testament, that's the story on repeat. Eventually... Israel would fall, the northern kingdom into the hands of the Assyrians and the southern kingdom into the hands of the Babylonians. But in that time frame, God would give them prophets who would regularly proclaim that there would be consequences for their sins, that they would suffer defeat at the hands of their enemies. They would be, as we sang this morning, a ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile. You'll see if you're reading the Advent uh, devotional, A Weary World Rejoices, that we've encouraged you all to get your hands on. You'll read this week of scorched places. The, the prophet Isaiah calls these places in which 
Israel finds themselves scorched places, a place where there is a great deal of sighing and sorrow. Israel, God's people, are broken and they're weary. There's the weary world of Israel. There's also the weary world of Anna. We don't know a lot about Anna other than what we are told in in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And uh, we're going to flip a lot this morning. But uh, we'll be in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. Actually, that's on the screen as well. Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38 tells us the story of Anna. This is the word of God. He says, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming at the very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of of Jerusalem. So here is Anna. She probably married young like most Jewish girls. Tragically, we hear that her husband, seven years into her marriage, has passed. And in that day, that would leave Anna in a very vulnerable place. Unwanted, alone, poor, and destitute. But what does Anna do? Well, we're told in this brief passage that she spends the rest of her years in the temple. But think about it, as a woman in this day, she could never hold a position in the temple. She would only be admitted into the outer courts of the temple, the place where only the broken people hang out. Uh, She was been on the same level of even the Gentiles in the pecking order of the temple, but this does not deter her. Day after day after day, After days, she returns to the outer courts of the temple. And when we find her in Luke 2, she's been serving those around her. She's been leading others in seasons of fasting and prayer. And she's been prophesying about the hope of redemption for decades. Our perception as we hear that of Anna, and as we should, is one of strength, compassion, and zealousness. But can we just... Imagine Anna at the pulpit this morning being honest that in those decades, there were moments that she was not okay. (laughs) That she was weary. I I think of, when I was thinking about Anna this week, I think of young moms, uh, maybe even being a bit biased of my own daughter watching her with her girls She loves her daughters, and she spends her days investing in their lives, in their lives, in their lives. Young moms, you ready to say amen, right? In their lives, at the expense of her own. But she loves it. (laughs) But if you ask her, are you weary? (laughs) Oh, yeah, she'll tell you she is weary. I think of my own life of ministry. I've been in full-time ministry now for 31 years. I started when I was three. I've been been preaching full-time now for almost 20 years. And and what if every time I stood in front of a group of teens or a, a group of people and I just said over and over again, Jesus is coming back. I'm telling you, I know he's coming back. I know he's coming back. For 30 years, that's what I proclaimed. I know Jesus is coming back. Day after day, I'm telling you, I know. I'll be honest with you. Maybe Anna's a whole lot more spiritual than me, but you get weary. And I wonder if Anna was weary going to the temple every day, telling a broken people, but I know the Messiah is coming. I know the Messiah is coming. I know the Messiah is coming. Would there have been moments in Anna's life, in the quietness maybe even of her own heart, she would have said, Jesus, would you hurry up? I'm weary. 
the weary world of Israel, there's the weary world of Anna, and finally there's the weary world of Nathaniel. Nathaniel, once again, someone we don't know a lot about. But I wanted to include Nathaniel because Nathaniel's real, and I like real people, and he kind of makes me smile. John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verses 43 through 46. We hear really one of the very few accounts that we understand of Nathaniel. John chapter 1, verses 43 through 46. This is the word of God. He says, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. So he's, he's in the early part of his ministry. He's in the place of, of calling his disciples. So he, Jesus goes to Galilee. He finds Philip and says to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and he said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said, ah, yes, that's awesome. Is that what he said? No, he said, can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> it's, a, it's an odd response, isn't it? Well, let, let's think about it together. So, so Jesus has met Philip along the way, and he invites Philip to follow him. Philip's answer is, yes, I want to follow you. But like Andrew before him, he wants to go tell someone else about Jesus first. And he has someone in mind. It's not as if he runs to anybody. He runs to this guy, Nathaniel. In other gospel accounts, he's known as Bartholomew. And listen closely to the language that Philip uses to describe Jesus, whom he has found. He says, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Uh, the language tells me that Philip is thinking that Nathaniel is going to flip his lid over the news of finding the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. And he's going to be so excited. That, that's, why, that's why Philip says, Jesus, wait here for a second. There's someone i got to tell because I just know he's going to be thrilled. And he runs to Nathaniel and he says, I found him. And it makes me think. That, that Nathaniel and Philip may have spent many nights around the, the candlelight studying the prophets, studying the law of Moses, thinking and praying and processing and, listen, waiting for this one whom they've read about to come. And that's why Philip is so doggone excited to go tell Nathaniel. You can see him running down the road. Nathaniel, Nathaniel, I found him. All those years we've studied, we've processed, we've prayed, we've waited. I found him. The one the law of Moses talks about. The one the prophets have been telling me about. The one we've studied. I found him. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. He's the son of Joseph. You ever have that friend? Right? When something good happens, you can't wait to tell them about it. I have some Michigan friends who I couldn't wait to tell them that Ohio State beat them, but they kind of reversed that on me yesterday. Right? You, you know what I mean? You just Because you've, you've thought about something for so long, you've prayed about something, and when it happens, you can't wait. This is Nathaniel. And Philip. But as Philip comes to tell Nathaniel, he gets an unexpected response, doesn't he? Can anything good come of Nazareth? I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I have some friends that, that I could tell you that, that I, if, if I went on this glorious vacation, let's just pretend like I, I'm going to go to the Grand Canyon, right? And I have this amazing vacation, right? And I see all these amazing sights. And I come back and I can't wait to tell this friend about the landscape that I saw. The, the canyon themselves. The experiences I had in the canyon, out of the canyon, watching the canyon. The people that I met. The places that I stayed. All these things. All these things. And, and I'm going waxing eloquently about all these things. And somewhere in the middle of all of that glorious news I said, And you know what? Once in a while I stayed in a cheap motel. Just to save money. But it was so good. It was so great. There was this, there was that, there was this, there was that. And, and I get to the end and I go, are you like excited for me? They would say, why would you stay in a cheap motel? 
Did you not hear what I just said? It was glorious. It was wonderful. I saw all these sights. And they're stuck on the cheap motel. This is Nathaniel. Like I'm Philip, so I found him. The one we studied about. The one we prayed for. The one we've been waiting for. Yeah, his name's Jesus of Nazareth. He's the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel skips all the glorious stuff and he goes, there ain't nothing good come from Nazareth. We find Nathaniel doubting, don't we? We find Nathaniel questioning. And if we read between the lines, I think we can find Nathaniel weary. You see, he has studied night after night after night. But in every crisis and in every problem, he has waited for this Jesus to come, and he hasn't come, and he hasn't come. And he's watched his nation suffer. He's watched his people suffer. And Jesus hasn't come, and Jesus hasn't come. So when Philip comes and says, I found him, Nathaniel's so weary. He's going, I, I don't think so. Not if he's from Nazareth. weary do you see yourself in those scenarios at all weary of the cycles in your life like Israel maybe especially the cycles of sin that just keep getting you nowhere living in a scorched land Weary of living in the hard places like Anna, trying to do the right things day after day after day, but the hard places don't get easier. Weary of waiting for the thing that that is to come that just might change everything like Nathaniel, but doubting that it might ever happen for you. And your optimism of celebration has changed to the pessimism of doubt. Any of those things resonate? Are you weary? Not okay? Well, I didn't bring you to the first Sunday of Advent to depress you. But to give you freedom to be in that place to tell you that there is hope. That there is hope. There is hope to be found in our weariness. And listen, it's not just a wishful hope. Like, I wish Ohio State would have won yesterday, right? I hope, right, that the Steelers will win today. It's not that wishful kind of thinking. That is not what this hope is. This hope is a certain hope. This hope that enters into our weary places, is Jesus. And it's why we sing in O Holy Night and why we have entitled this Advent series, The Weary World, what? Rejoices. Not here today to tell you that it's not going to be weary. (laughs) I am telling you that we can rejoice in our weariness. There is a hope. How does Israel, Anna, Nathaniel find this hope? How do they rejoice in their weariness? Uh, I'm glad you asked. The hope of Israel, listen, the hope of Israel is in their obedience. The hope of Israel is in their obedience. There's a hope that turns the image of a scorched land of Israel's disobedience into a watered garden, like a spring of water whose water does not fail. Isaiah chapter 58 in verse 11. So Isaiah 58 is this this amazing chapter reflecting on the reality of Israel that's saying, listen, you're you're trying to do these fasts, like you're you're, you're not eating, You're, you're doing these religious celebrations, but you're doing them for all the wrong reasons. You're doing them for yourself. And and then the prophet says, if only Am I bumping around here? If, if only you would begin to do these fasts, not for yourself, but for the glory of God. 
that, that in that fast that you would loose the bonds of wickedness, that you would undo the straps of the yoke to let the oppressed go free. That you would share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. He's telling Israel, listen, you're, you're going through the motions, but you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. But when you begin to do it for the right reason, listen to what he says in verse 11. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And then you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. How does Israel find hope in its scorched places? In obedience. And doing the next right thing. It is that hope that turns sighing into sorrow. In, in Isaiah 35, if you just back up from 58, a number of chapters, you'll see this glorious chapter, right? It's one that you should go back and read today. Isaiah 35 is one that should hang on your mirror. The problem is, is it comes after 34. <laughs> we don't like 34. It talks all about the judgment of God, right? It's honest about the reality of where we are. But he says, listen, in 35, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. And then you move to verse 10 at the end of that chapter. It says, the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. How do we get from 34 to 35? Well, the prophet will make it plain that it's Jesus. But he'll also make it plain that when we follow after this one who is to come, that we will be obedient in our lives and that in obedience we'll find joy even in scorched places. But that our sighing and our sorrow shall end. <laughs> Hear me out. The prophet is not saying, do right things and God somehow is obligated to bless you. It's not what he's saying. What the prophet is saying is that when we do right things, that you will find God and be blessed. God is in right things, in obedience. And when we live in that obedience, we will find him. We find hope in our weariness when we, when you do the next right thing. Because in the next right thing is where we'll find Jesus. The one who has died for our sins and has risen again to ultimately stop the cycles of our sin. It's why Isaiah in his prophecy says the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. <laughs> Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. For to us what? A child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Living in obedience is where we will find him. The hope of Israel was in obedience. And the hope of Anna is an ongoing alertness to the things of God. The hope of Anna is ongoing alertness to the things of God. She waited day after day after day after day in the temple. And you get the idea that in each day, she was attentive to everything God might be doing. And then there's one day where she's attentive to a stir. 
her companion in waiting, Simeon, can be overheard with a young couple and a baby saying, my eyes have seen your salvation. And this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And Anna would know that her waiting was done. That in her weariness, an answer had been given. And listen, if, if, Anna's distraction, if Anna's mind would have been distracted here to there to here to there, she may have missed the reality that this young family, that this young baby had come and that she would have missed meeting her Messiah. Anna found hope in an ongoing alertness to the things of God. And she was not attentive day after day so that God would bless her. She was attentive day after day because she knew that God was blessing her and she wanted to see it. Likewise, people of God, we, even in our weariness, need to be alert to the things of God around us, the promises that he is keeping daily, and our minds focus on the ultimate promise of Jesus. Is that a wearisome place? Yes, it can be, but it is a wearisome place where you will rejoice as you see Jesus. The hope of Israel is obedience. The hope of Anna is ongoing alertness to the things of God. And the hope of Nathaniel is stepping out even in his doubt. This story in John 1, I, I, I see, I think, myself in Nathaniel a bit. That's why I like it so much. But I, I want you to see something, right? We, we stopped short in that story of how it concludes. So here you have Philip coming to Nathaniel saying all these glorious things. This is the guy that Moses wrote about, the prophets wrote about that we've studied. And Nathaniel goes, ah, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. But you know what? Nathaniel didn't say, Philip, yeah, you follow him. I'm going to hang out here. It's not what he did. We're not told explicitly how it happened. But something happened in Nathaniel's heart, and Philip said, listen, dude, I don't care what you think of where he came from. Just follow me. Come see him. And Nathaniel said, like my granddaughter does sometimes, no. It's not, it's not what he did. He didn't have a pout attack, right? He didn't have a self attack. You know what he did? Oh, okay, I'll go see him. And he follows Philip. He overcomes his doubt and is obedient to do the night right next thing, being attentive maybe to the reality of what God was doing. And as he approached Jesus, Jesus approached him. And Jesus begins to have this conversation with Nathaniel as if Jesus had known him forever. He says, hey, you're the one of Israel that there is no deceit. That's a good explanation of that. But what I think Nathaniel received at that moment was, well, like, this guy knows me. And then it gets even better. I, I think the expression in Nathaniel's face was like, like, how do you know me? And Jesus goes, you think that's good? Like, I saw you a couple days ago underneath the fig tree having your devotions. Whoa. Like, how do you know I was under the fig tree having my devotions? And Jesus just smells because I've known you. And then it clicks for Nathaniel. And he says, you are the king of Israel. You are the son of God. See, if Nathaniel would have stayed in his pout place, God ain't giving me everything I want. God ain't doing what I'm thinking he's supposed to do. If he stays in his pout place, he doesn't experience the reality of a Jesus who knows him. Nathaniel's obedience was stepping out even in his doubt. He doesn't hide out. He doesn't pout. He actually moves forward. And what he finds turns his scorched land into well-watered gardens. Listen, I'm not okay. And neither are you. We are weary, but here is good news. That in our weary worlds, we can rejoice over a hope of greater things. 
Hillary Scott writes a song called Thy Will. And she's honest in the song. I don't know if you've heard the song, but she, in one of the verses, says this. Speaking of God or to God, God, I know you're good, but this doesn't feel good right now. And I know you think of things that I could never think about. It's hard to count it all joy, distracted by all the noise. I'm just trying to make sense of all your promises. And sometimes I got to stop. Sometimes I got to stop and remember that you're God and I'm not. So, thy will be done. Hillary Scott writes that song out of the very difficult place of miscarriage. She's weary. But when she understands that God is bigger than her and bigger than her circumstances, she can rejoice in knowing, surrendering to, submitting to, as Dick said this morning, the will of God. She's not okay. She's weary. But even in her weariness, she rejoices. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and to look forward to something greater to come. The celebration of Advent is possible only to those who aren't okay. Because in our not okayness, we look to something greater. We look and we find Jesus. We do that in a life of trust in God. We do that in a life of obedience. We do that by doing the next right thing, being attentive to the things of God around us and stepping out even when our doubt is high, all believing that we will find living hope in Jesus, our Savior.